Hello everyone, it's me, Demetrius Villa from the High Speed Rail America Club, and we have a very special guest today, Mr. Scott Jarvis from the California High Speed Rail Authority. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so, Scott, you want to introduce yourself to the viewers and who you are and uh, how, um, in what position you work for for the California High Speed Rail Authority? Yes, yeah. Um, as you said, I'm Scott Jarvis. I'm the chief engineer for the California High Speed Rail Authority. So in that role, I'm responsible for the delivery of the program. I uh, primarily focus now on the, the civil infrastructure being delivered. So um, those uh, delivery functions related to engineering, such as engineering, design, construction, those are really my, my focus areas. Right. Okay, and uh, according to here, you've worked for 26 years at the California Department of Transportation. Um, what were some of your biggest challenges in that department and how you're bringing the, that experience over to the high-speed rail sector? Okay, well, most of my experience was related to delivering projects, getting projects through the delivery phases of planning, design, construction. So a lot of project management experience and a lot of experience related to construction management. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, California Department of Transportation or Caltrans is delivering civil infrastructure, um, highways, bridges, etc. And 80% uh, of our program from a cost standpoint is civil work. So there is certainly a direct uh, relationship of the experience that I had in project delivery at Caltrans um, to the High Speed Rail Authority. So, you know, because I spent a lot of my time in, in construction, there's many challenges through, through the years, but, you know, one that really comes to mind was um, rehabilitating Interstate 5 through downtown Sacramento. Um, it's about 200,000 vehicles per day, and we had a plan to, to do that work in several years, do the work at night. Uh, very short uh, lane closures and then after we awarded the construction contract our director gave us a challenge and said you need to really accelerate this work instead of taking several years do it in a couple of months so I was like wow how, how are we going to do that so we kind of worked with the contractor and um, worked with our traffic operations people and, and proposed well what if we closed I-5 through, through Sacramento one direction at a time. And, um, you know, that was something that Caltrans really didn't do with its policies, but, uh, but we did, um, got it worked out. Um, there was a huge amount of work to do in a very short amount of time to develop the change order, the incentives, the disincentives, the detours, and, and so forth. So, um, and then start working on it 24 seven. So instead of a couple out, a couple of uh, years, we finished the project in a couple of months. So. That was, that was a big challenge just from a construction standpoint and getting that amount of work done in a very short period of time. That's so. incredible. And the amount of jobs this also brings also too, right? I mean, how, how many jobs is the, the California, I think it was around, uh, what, tens of thousands of the, the high speed bills going to bring? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. Ten, tens of thousands. I mean, it, it's not only the direct jobs that you traditionally think of, such as the, the trades and, and the crafts, but... A lot of the professional jobs that go along with it, um, both in, in delivering the program and then ultimately just opening, connecting the communities of the state, so opening up the economies throughout the state will will translate into a, a lot of jobs as well. Yes, because a lot of people just put it, you know, and just to the construction jobs also too, but, you know, as, as we've seen with all these projects, this all comes out and spreads out into different sections also too as well. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Perfect. So, um, Robert Eccles of Texas Central Railway, he's the president of that company, Michael Reininger of All Aboard Florida, they, they all have, you know, huge uh, projects that everybody knows about also too as well that are in the high-speed rail. Uh, they believe that their projects once completed will dispel any notion of it being a boondoggle when people see high-speed rail up and running. Does this notion also apply to the California high-speed rail project also too as well? Yeah, well, I think the, the notion that it won't be a boondoggle definitely applies. You know, boondoggle is often used in the sense of a, of a government boondoggle. But really what high-speed rail is, is around the world is free people making choices of what transportation mode that they use. 
and throughout the world where high-speed rail has been implemented, which it's, it's up and running in a dozen countries and rapidly expanding from there, you know, free people choose to use it. And, and um, other modes of transportation have gone down significantly with high-speed rail usage going up significantly. So, you know, in, in that sense, it's, it's not a boondoggle. It's, it's free people choosing how, what uh, form of transportation they want to use. Also, like I said, you know, boondoggle is kind of often referred to as a government bureaucracy type, type of thing, and that's not how California High Speed Rail is set up at all. We're very much a private-public partnership. Um, in fact, um, if, if you go just with the number of positions necessary to deliver this program, over 90% of them are private. Um, we, we have a small team overall at High Speed Rail Authority providing that you know government leadership and vision and, and overall management of the program but we use the private enterprise significantly in all phases of delivery to help us plan design construct the and ultimately deliver the project and, and that will also carry over into the operations phase where um, it'll be uh, very much private enterprise centric with that overall government oversight role so yeah, so I mean, uh, to bring up, the, we do want to put emphasis on the whole public-private partnership, uh, P3, as some people put it, um, because that, that's a lot of people have been saying, oh, this is a government project, so there's going to be a lot of waste, but when you, know, when you mention that there's going to be a lot of private, and there is a lot of private, uh, uh, how would you say it, a lot of private involvement into the project, I mean, you, you get to see, and a lot of people would be able to, you know, dispel that, uh, that fear. Uh, oh, this is going to be a waste or something like that. And also, too, um, yesterday, I think it was big, a big news also, too, as well this week, that uh, a judge also uh, supported uh, the California high-speed rail uh, vote as well and the support of it. So, I mean, to say, also say that the citizen support of this as well also, you know, brings to fact that there's a lot of support for this. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, no, that was, that was, a, it was a good day for us yesterday with the, the judge's ruling and just, you know, confirming our, our direction that, you know, in, indeed we're a fast, modern, environmentally sensitive program move, moving forward and it was nice to get that ruling from, from the court and it just uh, adds to that momentum that we've been building in our program. Absolutely. Yeah. Alright. Um, so how does the California High Speed Rail Project compare to alternatives such as building another highway or an airport? Well, we're not here to replace those other forms of transportation. They are important and they're part of the overall transportation system. Um, so those other forms will continue and what we provide is another transportation option and we connect in to those other transportation forms. So we really work together with them and providing the, the people uh, you know, an, another mode of, of transportation that they can choose from. But obviously our population in California is expanding rapidly. Um, in you know, not too many years it's predicted we'll be 50 million people plus in, in California. And so we need to, to plan ahead for that. And anybody that's driven around California knows the, the amount of uh, gridlock that, that we have, especially in our urban areas like the Bay Area and Los Angeles area. So, um, you know, it's, this is really planning for the future and, um, you know, if we were to try to get that same level of capacity with those other modes, such as the highways, such as uh, airline, you know, it would cost two to three times as, as much, not be as environmentally sensitive, sensitive and sustainable as the, the high-speed rail system. So, um, so yeah, it's... Uh, it's a different mode of transportation, but overall, it, we think it's a very eff effective and efficient mode that people are going to choose to use. Right. And speaking of modes of transportation, I'm sure everybody knows about uh, Elon Musk's idea of his uh, fifth mode of transportation, uh, the Hyperloop, which uh, was a reaction towards uh, the California high-speed rail project. Uh, do you consider that uh, a fringe project or a distraction from the, the reality of high-speed rail? Uh, you know, I don't really consider it a, a distraction. I mean, people, it's human nature. We're very interested in new and exciting forms of, of transportation, but high-speed rail is a proven technology. 
as I said, used in, in a dozen and growing countries th throughout the world. Hyperloop isn't there yet in its development. I mean, so I can understand why people are intrigued by it. It's so so different and, um, you know, it, it would be so, so cutting edge. But in reality, it, it's not a proven technology yet. There's a lot of things that would have to be worked out uh, before it would become operational. And another thing is, you know, high-speed rail, it really is a mode of transportation for the masses. And something like Hyperloop is that um, if it were ever implemented, it would be something for very few people to, to take. So we don't really look at it as a, a distraction or, or a competition. We, I think we understand why people are intrigued by it. It's a new, sexy, possible form of transportation, but um, we're, we continue on our path of a proven technology and, and a way to move a lot of people in a fast and effective and a safe way. All right. Okay. And last question. Uh, personally, why do you believe high-speed rail has been so hard to catch up here in America in the past 50 years? I think a lot of it is just lack of experience of people. Um, you know, I often when I talk, I'll ask people, how many of you have taken high-speed rail? And the people that raise their hands pretty much unanimously are big fans of high-speed rail. So if you've never ridden or experienced a form of transportation like high-speed rail, it's probably hard to really visualize it and really be a big proponent of it. Um, and obviously we have a very big automobile and highway culture in this country and it, it has served as well. Um, as you mentioned, I have spent a pretty long career in a, a transportation business that's primarily focused on, on highways. And again, we're not here to replace that, we're here to, to augment that. Uh, but there is certainly a culture in our country of using the, the automobile and, and so that's probably a, a factor as, as well. And then I also just think that, you know, Big new projects in this country are very difficult to, to deliver now. I mean, you really think about um, big public infrastructure projects, capacity increasing um, transportation in this country. We haven't had anything since the interstate program, which was initiated in the 50s. I mean, we've had a lot of infrastructure projects, but a lot of them are uh, rehabilitations or improvements of existing infrastructure but something completely new like this it's been many decades since that has been uh, implemented and um, you know there's a lot of reasons for that but I do think that that's a a factor of uh, you know it's put the United States behind other industrialized countries um, in the development of, of high-speed rail um, and then I, I would say the, the final area is just some some policy decisions um, you know, something like this is, in, especially in the initial stages, you do need the support from, from government. Private enterprise, even though I mentioned this is a significant private enterprise program, and it is, they're not going to initially take on the significant risks of procuring right away, getting environmental clearance, some of the real risky things that traditionally the government has, has taken those, those roles on. And so, um, you know, there needs to be government funding. There needs to be those overall policy decisions to, to put the funding towards public infrastructure to get these projects at, at least off the rent ground and, and moving. So I think there's just kind of a whole combination of reasons that it's made it a little bit difficult for high-speed rail to get implemented um, in, in this country. But uh, the good thing is, is we've worked through a lot of those, those challenges and, and we're really uh, building momentum. So we're a program that's here to stay now. We also have a contributor question also too from Austin Huang. Uh, he's also a member of the High Speed Rail America Club. He's asking, when will the official rolling stock be announced? We are developing the procurement documents for the rolling stock um, now. Um, we, if things go as planned, um, late this year or early next year, that procurement will begin. And so to, to actually go through the, the process and select the, the vendor and, and the rolling stock, we're probably about a year and a half, two, two years away. But we're, we're, we are 
um, beginning the, the process of the procurement now. Yeah, because I know there's a lot of competition, especially from the Japanese, the Germans, and the Chinese who want to see if they can put in their rolling stock into there and also provide a lot of uh, the systems as well behind it. So it, it, it's a lot of effort, especially from not just like from our government also too as well, from, but from the government of these other countries who do have experience with high-speed rail systems in their, uh, in their own home countries. Well, absolutely, and that goes back to my emphasis before that we're we're more of a private program than we are a public program, and you know we are taking that expertise from around the world and bringing it into our delivery, bringing it into our procurement processes, helping inform us so that we can get the best um, services for for the people. So it's it's kind of an advantage to us in in a sense that. There's a lot to learn um, from around the world with high-speed rail, and we're taking advantage of that expertise. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott Jarvis. Thank you so much for being here on the program, and thank you and to all the, the employees at California High-Speed Rail Authority and to all the supporters as well for helping to make this project a reality and to bring it uh, also to fruition. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thanks for watching this amazing interview with Scott from the California High-Speed Rail Authority. Be sure to subscribe to the High Speed Rail America Club to get on board the American Revolution. You can also watch our documentary The American Train which has been a hit so far and you can also see our interview with Judge Robert Eccles of the Texas Central Railway.